Welcome to I Love to Tell the Story, a podcast of the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Katherine Schifferdecker. And I'm Christopher Van Kaufman. And this is the podcast for April 2nd, 2023. It's Palm Sunday or Passion Sunday, uh, another name for it. And our text uh, appointed for today is Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 17. It's Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. Uh, we should say, by the way, it, you just have two of us this time, uh, just because of scheduling conflicts, uh, we couldn't uh, get either Rolf or Joy uh, or someone else. So uh, you have Christopher and myself. Uh, Christopher is a New Testament scholar, and I'm a, an Old Testament scholar. And both are relevant for this text, right? We have a lot of Very quotations. So. Yeah, a lot of quotations from yeah. Psalms and other places. Um, and uh, that's that's true a lot in Matthew. Is that right, Chris? It is. We talked about way at the beginning of Matthew that Matthew really is interested in what we call fulfillment quotations, where he will say something like, this took place to fulfill and then quote the Old Testament. And we get that here uh, in the triumphal entry. One of the things I think we should just give a sentence or two, you said that this is both Palm Sunday, and we know that because we're reading the story of the triumphal entry with the cutting of palm branches, but sometimes also called Passion Sunday. Do you want to just say a little bit, Catherine, about why those two things go together? Yeah, I I, I should know the history of that more than I do, but my understanding is that um, because a lot of uh, congregants do not uh, come to church um, on Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday during Holy Week, uh, then they don't hear the story of the Passion every year. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so this is kind of a um, concession to those who would uh, who who would not be able to come or not or choose not to come on Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday. And so it becomes then a, a encapsulation of Holy Week uh, on Palm Sunday so that you hear the story of Jesus' passion, as well as the triumphal entry. And of course, the triumphal entry is the beginning of that story, really. Yeah. Right? He's, he's entering into Jerusalem to celebrate Passover uh, with his disciples, but he knows that, uh, uh, and everyone knows, uh, but Jesus especially, that that uh, it's not simply another observance or celebration of Passover. Do you want to say more about that, Christopher? No, I think that's a that's a great summary, you know, where if you just went to church on this Sunday, you'd get the right. triumphal entry, and then the next Sunday is Easter, and there's important things that happen in between, so that's exactly. why the passion gets uh, included here as well. I the remember... Oh, keep well, going. Well, just a, a brief anecdote. When I was growing up, I was <laughs> a church nerd. Uh, my father was the organist, and I remember kind of feeling sorry for those people who didn't come to church on Good Friday. <laughs> Because they missed the, you know, the dramatic, well, the stripping of the altar on Monday, Thursday, and then uh, the the reading of the Passion Story on Good Friday, and they, then they just went straight to Easter, and it seemed like they missed a lot of of, uh, of what Easter was about by not experiencing the crucifixion or hearing the mm -hmm. story of the crucifixion again. So I remember uh, when I was the self-appointed chaplain of my youth group, we... <laughs> We uh, took over the, uh, with the pastor's blessing, took over the uh, um, sunrise service on Easter morning. And we started out with, uh, you know, the lights off and the candles unlit and and um, kind of painter sheets over all the uh, the altar and the, and the lilies and stuff. Uh, and and I got up in the pulpit and talked about the the sorrow that the women felt on the way to the tomb. And then uh, we proclaimed Christ is risen, or read the Easter account, proclaimed Christ is risen, and then the music played and the lights came on and the candles were lit. It, it, I had never heard of the Easter vigil, uh, but it, I think it was uh, trying to do uh, something along the same lines as that, to, because it is, I, I think it is just the case that you don't, the, the Easter hallelujahs are not as robust if you don't go through the lament of Good Friday. So. Yeah. I agree. And one of the things that we'll see as we get into this Sunday's stories, as well as the next couple of lectionary readings, is that this is a dramatic story. And in the medieval period, what were called passion plays were very popular because of the ability to dramatize the story. And they always start with the triumphal entry and yeah. then proceed through the crucifixion and the resurrection. And so it's an appropriate things to put together. Yeah. 
Yeah, but one of the difficulties we have with this and the difficulty that you will face as a preacher is that we've got a lot to chew on. So we start, <laughs> of course, with the triumphal entry, which has so much, as we said, so much Old Testament resonance and so many very strong claims about the identity of Christ uh, going on here. But then we go and immediately we get the uh, turning over the tables in the temple. And right. that this too is another uh, another story that you could say so much about. And so taking these two together is a an interesting challenge. And I hope we can consider that a little bit today. Yeah, I, I appreciated the commentary uh, on the Working Preacher website by Warren Carter. I think he does a good job of um, contrasting Jesus' entry into Jerusalem with uh, the claims of Roman imperial power. So uh, mm -hmm. if you have not read that yet, uh, our listeners, uh, I would certainly uh, recommend that. I think that this idea that Jesus in, in one way um, imitates imperial power, right, by this triumphal entry into Jerusalem, like a like a like a conquering hero, right? And at the same time, he he challenges or undermines that imperial power, uh, right? Because he doesn't come riding in on a war horse; he rides in on a donkey, uh, two donkeys, if Matthew is correct, <laughs> uh, right? And mm -hmm. and the people who are greeting him are quoting uh, Psalm one eighteen, which is. Um, uh, part of the Hallel. Uh, so the, the Hallel is a, a long prayer made up of Psalms 113 to 118 that is said on Passover, that is recited or sung uh, on Passover. And so they're singing, Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven, quoting uh, in large part Psalm 118. Mm -hmm. um, and that so the, you know, this isn't a Roman imperial uh, conqueror, this is a son of David, right? Uh, David, the golden king of Israel, whom, of course, we've talked about back in the fall as well. You can remind your uh, your congregants about that story. Yeah, and I think it's also important, too, to think about the way that imagery is used in this passage. So one of the imagery you've already talked about is the imagery of the donkey. And I'm reminded that uh, in the book of uh, the books of Samuel, we hear about Samuel going out and finding Saul. And Saul, of course, is out looking for his father's donkeys. And there is this way in which uh, we see these animals appear throughout texts. And we ask the question, when we see that, kind of what the connection is there? and What sort of resonances come up when you think about these animals? And in the same way, this idea of people spreading their cloaks on the road and the palm branches, we have symbolic imagery that is helping to tell us something about Jesus, that it's not just details that are put in there for uh, description, but really to help us see what sort of, in this case, king that the crowds are imagining Jesus to be. And one of the things about this story and that we see right away, and that's one of the good things about putting the triumphal entry and the cleansing of the temple together, is suddenly we see the contrast between Jesus's entry, his rejection of the way that the temple structure is working as it is, mm -hmm. and then we go from that straight into the passion. And the passion, of course, being a commentary on Jesus's role as king and the way in which his role as Messiah plays out contrary to the expectations in many ways that have been set up during the triumphal entry. And so there are ways in which having those three stories together uh, really helps us to see both the heightened expectations that the triumphal entry brings, but then also the very sharp reversal that happens. Yeah. You... Hmm. Yeah. No, didn't mean to interrupt you. I just. No, no uh, problem. Well, that that sharp reversal, right? These same crowds that are saying Hosanna to the son of David. Uh, are probably at least some of them among the same crowds that call, you know, that cry out, crucify him uh, later on. Um, so there's, there's a, yeah, there's an expectation there of um, challenge to Roman power, right? That, that this, that Jesus will be the long awaited Messiah, the long awaited son of David who will um, 
usher in God's reign. And that is all true, of course, but not in the way uh, that the crowds uh, of his day probably hoped for. Yeah. And I think within that, uh, we were just talking about in one of my classes on Matthew, talking about the expectations. And I think it's important to tie this back to David, as you talked about kind of the hero par excellence of Israelite history, but also to think about this in terms of somewhat more recent events, like the struggles of the Maccabees to mm. cleanse the temple after its desecration by Antiochus Epiphanes, and the way in which we have some of that same plot line going on here, Jesus's triumphal entry, and where does he go straight to? He goes to the temple, and he makes mm. a, a very strong statement about the way that the temple should be treated and the, the role the temple should play in the lives of the people. And when you think about the these kind of resonances, you see that uh, the, this is not a historically or biblically isolated set of images that are going on here. And I think that this is one of those rich stories that those parallels can help to kind of illuminate the expectations and so forth of people. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's helpful, Christopher. I'm looking at, um, you know, the cleansing of the temple, and he says, as uh, you've already said, this is a common thing in Matthew, right? A quotation of kind of fulfillment thing, but mm -hmm. my house shall be called, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. I think it's, he's, he's conflating or, or borrowing both from Isaiah and from uh, Jeremiah there. Mm -hmm that he looks like a prophet here, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, he, Jesus looks like a prophet who um, calls down judgment or or announces judgment on the re religious authorities who have um, desecrated, maybe um, would be a good word, the, the, the house of the Lord, which mm -hmm. was designed, uh, as Isaiah says, to be a house of prayer for all people. Uh, but they're making it into kind of a common marketplace uh, and and profiting, at least the religious elite and those that they, you know, the money changers, profiting from that, um, mm -hmm. from that desecration of the temple. And we even see this in Matthew 21, 11, right before this, you know, the crowd say, this is the prophet Jesus from mm -hmm. Nazareth and Galilee. Yeah. And this again goes to one of the things that uh, would have been in people's minds when thinking about prophets, you think about Isaiah or you think about Jeremiah, is the uneasy relationship that they have with those who are in power. And in all honesty, the sometimes grisly ends that the prophets yeah. meet. And so again, it's important that this is, I think, to help your congregation, congregation see the way that Matthew is really trying to draw upon a strong Old Testament tradition and uh, help people to see where Jesus fits into that. Yeah. And as you say, the grizzly and that often prophets meet, uh, you know, no sane person wants to be a prophet. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I tell my students, right? Uh, some of whom would like to be prophetic. And sometimes there's a place for that, but the prophets uh, have a hard life. And so this to, I think, contributes to the sense of foreboding, perhaps, that surrounds this, surrounds that, you know, it's a beautiful celebration, it's a joyful celebration. Hosanna actually means save us, right? Hoshi Anu uh, in Hebrew in Psalm 118, 25. There's a, there's, a, there's a triumph here, there's a celebration, but there is also an undercurrent, a strong undercurrent of um, foreboding. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. This this is not going to turn out well, <laughs> at no. least not immediately. Uh, no. Right. So no. a good uh, a good way to get us into Holy Week, I think, uh, mm -hmm. to 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 celebrate Jesus kingship, uh, but to also uh, foreground uh, or foreshadow uh, what is coming in the days uh, to come. Yeah, I think that's a, a great weeks. lead up to our next two episodes on Monday, Thursday and on Good Friday.